Good morning, church. Greetings in the strong name of Jesus. Will you stand as we worship our Redeemer this morning and declare that God is good? All the time. Amen. And all the time? God is good. Praise God. Let's bless his name this morning. Blessed be your name, land that is plentiful.
Blessed to have you with us this morning. If you're joining us live uh, on Sunday morning broadcast on our Facebook page, welcome. Welcome, all you guys out in the field there. Nice to see you. Um, blessed to have you with us this morning. We are going to be in the book of Acts this morning. Pastor Nolan is going to be sharing um, chapter 13, verses 43 through 52. At least that's what he says. And the uh, title of today's message is going to be um, Paul's First Missionary Journey, Part 4. Right? Did I get it right? Okay. 
Just a reminder, women's Bible studies coming up on uh, March 24th. It's at 545. It's going to be on Zoom. So if you're interested in uh, joining that, ladies, see my wife Sue, and she'll get you hooked up with the right information. And I still like to encourage you guys that I may be on the fence of joining us on uh, Wednesday night for our men's fellowship. We're going through the book of Revelation. I think we're in chapter 2. Uh, we're going through it with uh, Dan Spielberger. He's leading us through Zoom. Well, through us, actually YouTube, but it's a really, really great time, uh, not only for fellowship, but this guy is, uh, he's just a great teacher. So I encourage you to come and see us at the door, at, and we meet at uh, 6.30, um, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6 to 7.30, and you're, and you're home. And i uh, also like to encourage you, if you're not involved in home fellowship, we have three home fellowships. We have, uh, that meet on Friday night, one at um, the Joiners, where you can join them. Joiners, join them. Everything else together. Yeah. And uh, they leave, uh, they actually meet in person and on Zoom. Then we have uh, the Door Fellowship, which actually meets on Zoom. I teach that. And then Barkley has his home fellowship on Zoom also. All that information you can find on our website. So I encourage you to get involved. Youth group also. Um, they're still meeting on Zoom, right? No, we're, no. we're in person and Zoom. So oh, in person go. and Zoom now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's in person at the Door. The Door. The door. So if you're not involved, you know, take advantage of these things. Um, what else do I have? Just a heads up, Good Friday's coming. And we are going to have a broadcast on our Facebook page for that. And Pastor Nolan will be sharing um, a Good Friday message. So kind of put that under your mental notes. Let's pray for today's service and today's tithes and offerings. Thank you, Lord, for just the blessings, God, that we take for granted, don't even realize, Lord, just your grace in itself is overwhelming, Lord, how you've um, saved each one of us, Lord. You've reached into our hearts, Lord, and revealed the truth about yourself, the truth about us, and our need for you. We thank you for that. Lord, take this time to just uh, pierce our minds and our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Lord, let your Holy Spirit have freedom in this place, in all of our hearts. Take our tithes and offerings, Lord, and use them, Father, for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Rayson, for wonderful worship this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for being here and for inhabiting our praise. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, if you would. And uh, Sometime back, I can't remember when exactly it was, but sometime back we had a missionary speaker that came and spoke at our church, and maybe you remember this account that he gave. He uh, told a, an embarrassing story about himself. He said, uh, not at your church, but he said, one of the places that I went and spoke, I got lost on the way there, couldn't find the church, I finally got there just in time, the, the, song, the singing was all over, got out of my car, the deacons met me, took me up to the pulpit, go. And he said, I had to go to the bathroom really, really bad. <laughs> I'd been out on the road for a long time. And he said, so I just told the people, excuse me, but I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and so he walked off the pulpit, and he's on the back in a few minutes, and he came back and, and uh, finished his sermon. And that was an embarrassing time for him. I was trying to put myself in that position uh, until this morning. I left home, and uh, as I got out of the highway, my... Uh, practice is, is if I run late on anything on Sunday morning, whether it's still studying or contemplating or whatever, I shave in the car on the way to church. Guess what happened this morning? My razor was dead in the car. <laughs> Judy left, but I left this morning, she kissed me goodbye, handed me two pieces of bacon, and he said, you're going to shave, aren't you? And I said, oh yeah, I'll shave on the way. Uh, welcome to the men's retreat uh, over right in South Bay. <laughs> As I appear before you in my unshaven glory. But nevertheless, we're here, and you didn't come to see me anyway. You came here from the Lord. So uh, that's what we're going to do this morning. Let's pray uh, before we begin. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb who was slain, who has borne all our sins and cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. Make each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, in our last study, in Acts chapter um, 13, um, we um, finished studying through Paul's longest recorded sermon delivered to the Jewish congregation along with the Gentile proselytes. He was at the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, and this was the land of the Galatians, present-day Esparta province in southwestern Turkey. Paul and Barnabas were on Paul's first missionary journey, approximately 44 to 46 AD. The missionary journey would last two years. They had taken along with them Barnabas, uh, the young cousin of, uh, or uh, John Mark, the young cousin of Barnabas. But for some reason not specified, uh, John Mark left the team and returned to Jerusalem. Paul preached a powerful sermon that day under the power of the Holy Spirit presenting Jesus as the culmination of Jewish history, the perfect fulfillment of prophecy, and the only justifier of sinners. The New Testament wasn't written, so he preached from the Old Testament, and he preached showing Jesus as God's forever plan of redemption. Because you see, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was all prophesied in the Old Testament. It would be this, by this plan that God would bring forward the sure mercies of David to all who believed upon him. Promises that were given to David, third back in Isaiah chapter 58, or about him, and to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Everlasting life in the Messiah's kingdom, that's what the sure mercies of David was. And so Paul preached about those blessings and what it meant for the day that they were in. The lesson really concluded with this thought, everyone who believes is justified by their faith. Justified, meaning just as if they had not sinned, if they believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's sermon ended with a conclusion which wouldn't be very popular in today's milk toast, come to Jesus and be happy service era. He ended his sermon with a dire warning from Habakkuk's ancient prophetic call to Judah, 600 years earlier, from Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 5. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, was warning and pointing toward all who would come and hear the message of the gospel, but not believe upon it. Upon it. Back in the past, the present, the future, these were the words that he quoted from um, in Acts chapter 13, verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Clearly, the unbelievers who fall into this warning were responsible for their decision not to believe. There was no lack of expense paid for the salvation of the people then, as there is it today. Jesus went to the cross and paid and provided atonement for every person's sin by his death on Calvary. They had received the message from the same people that uh, received it that didn't uh, accept the message of salvation, that ambassador that God had sent to them by the Holy Spirit. All of this offer of salvation came from God, who scripture says desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You should write that down somewhere, 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. That's God's desire, that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The same God who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life, our most famous verse that most of us can quote easily, John 3.16. There was no shortage of love or desire or power or method on God's part to keep them from belief, culminating in their damnation. The damnation, in fact, here that he uses the word 
perishment. God cannot be blamed for their unbelief. This was their decision opposing God's desire and rejecting God's love. And God held them responsible. Now, let me tell you some things that, uh, an introduction to the introduction, I guess. I have worried over today's message. Worried, I, I suppose we'd have to say worried, um, because there are things to share today that are not agreed upon in, uh, by many scholars in the world of Christianity today. And yet, uh, one of the blessings or curses of having to go through the Bible verse by verse is you can't pass over things that are difficult. You have to go through them. And you have to think through them. And you have to study through them. And you have to come to your own conclusions through them. And you have to think of the messages that you've heard and the books that you've read. There were three books that I read for today's message, trying to make sure that, you know, the hardest thing, the biggest uh, worry of every pastor, and those of you guys that are, that are pastors that teach, you know, the hardest thing is the, the biggest pressure you feel is always to make sure that you rightly divide the Word of God. That's the, the, the most uh, pressure-packed thing in your heart as you're studying and preparing to teach. And so as I present some things that are my conclusions on things that all people, maybe that some of you don't agree with, I'm just telling you that these are my conclusions. And um, but I feel uh, that it's my responsibility to share them. Some would agree in our day, since about 1500 AT, AT, AD, yes, unbelievers are responsible, but in all actuality, the reason they chose unbelief was that, they, that God hadn't chosen them for salvation. He sovereignly chose and determined their lostness and damnation as he chose others for salvation. Now, this is a doctrine that I personally have difficulty with. To me, this belief, I believe, impugns the very nature and character of God, and it seems to make the offer of salvation disingenuous. If God sends the offer of salvation knowing ahead of time that he prevents some from receiving it, that seems disingenuous to me. This week, I took some time to review all the recorded sermons of the book of Acts. Uh, there are 15 of them. Of those 15, five were preached to gatherings of yet unconverted people. I wanted to be reminded of what each evangelist called the people to do to be included in God's kingdom. And indeed, that's what the call was. That's why they were there, was to tell them the gospel and how they could be part of of the kingdom of heaven, this is what I found in order as I went through the five that were delivered to people who do did not believe. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be converted. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Repent. In fact, call all men everywhere to repent. Most of the, those gospel messages pointed out that the hearers were guilty of the sin of unbelief, which led to other sins, even participating in Jesus' crucifixion. Though some of the listeners did repent and believe, most didn't. And that's the way that it happens today in our day. In fact, Jesus told us that ahead of time. He said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The questions surrounding the sovereignty of God and man's responsibility in salvation is a 500-year-old unresolved issue. Even though it's about salvation... A, person, a person's position on these issues doesn't determine anyone's salvation. The greatest biblical scholars, pastors, and teachers since the 1500s disagree based on Scripture. And we're talk, not talking about good guys against bad guys. We're talking about spiritually minded men looking for truth. 
coming up with differing conclusions as they read through the scripture. Is God sovereign? Of course he is. He has no one that he must answer to. There is no Mrs. God in heaven. There is no one to, that he needs to submit to or run things past. In the heavenly place he is God. On earth and on heaven is God over all heaven and earth. Did God choose the elect before the foundations of the earth were formed, predestining and adopting believers for heaven? Well, Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6, if you're quick and nimble with your fingers, you can look these up as we go. Otherwise, I'll just read them to you. But Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6 says, yes, that's absolutely true. God did choose the elect before foundations. Let me read it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Can a man do anything to merit salvation? Nope. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Nope is a Hebrew. No, it's a Greek term. It means no. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Was the death of on Calvary of Jesus, efficacious, meaning was it effective? Was it effective enough to take the sins of the whole world away? Well, 1 John 1, chapter 2, verse 2 says, yes, and he himself is the propitiation, that means the appeasing or the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. John 1, 29, this is when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming down to be baptized and he calls out to the people that are listening to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the, the world. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for a couple of people. No, a ransom for all. To be testified in due time for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might test, taste death for everyone. Can a man or a woman come to Christ without God calling him or her to him? Well, not according to John 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The question is, has God been calling to all men ever since this time? Well, as I was studying this week, one thing I noticed that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have been calling all men since that time, and even before that time. Look in Romans 1, verses 18 through 22. This is God's testimony. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts, were darkened. That's God's testimony. I've been calling men since the time of creation to come, to come into my kingdom. And I sent my son and I 
prophesied through the prophets, through them, through all that time. Well, what about Jesus? Has Jesus been testifying since that time? Well, listen to the words of Jesus in John 12, 32. Jesus said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he says, signifying what death he would die. Jesus was lifted up. He was lifted up on the cross. And he was also lifted up into heaven. And he says, I will draw all people. And so the Father and the Son drawing all people. I remember when I was in India and I had the Gospel Cube, the Evangel Cube. Some of you are familiar with that. To use as a tool to uh, share evangelism. And uh, I went into this one house and I just happened to be holding the this cube. And you open it up and the story unfolds as you open up the pieces. But it was on the picture of Jesus on the cross. And we didn't, I didn't get into the sermon at all. And the man in Vishnupriya Manipuri language said to the interpreter, pointing to the cube, he says, What is that about? I've seen that picture before. What is that about? And as it turns out, he'd seen the video of the Passion of the Christ that had the picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. He didn't know what it was, but he, he needed to know what it was. He knew it was important. Jesus has been drawing people to himself ever since that time that he was lifted up on the cross. And what about the Holy Spirit? His testimony is found in John 16, 7 through 11. Well, Jesus' testimony about him, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment of sin because they do not believe me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The Father, the Son, the Spirit have been testifying, drawing people to Christ since the beginning of time. So the question remains, if God is sovereign, and He is, if He chose His elect saved ones before the world was created, and clearly He did, if he sent his son to be the propitiation for the whole world and his death satisfied or appeased the price of sin for all men, which it did, if no one can come to salvation without the Father drawing, which is true and he's done, if the whole Godhead, including God, the Son and the Holy Spirit, has been at work testifying to all men, which takes away every man's excuse, was that true? It certainly was. On what basis did God choose the elect in eternity past? Now you might disagree with me at this point, but I'm telling you my point of view from my study. For me, God's character and attributes prevents me from believing that his choice was capricious or arbitrary. Now, it's possible, even probable, that there are things I just will never understand about this and many other heavenly matters until I enter heaven's rest. Some scriptures emphasize God's sovereign election, and other verses emphasize man's responsibility to believe. And since all scripture is God-breathed, I assume that correlating God's thoughts at times are past my finding out. And that certainly seems to be the case here with me this morning. In Isaiah 55, verse 9, it explains to us that there are some things that are past finding out. Our ways are not His ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. One of the most prominent voices in support of a strong divine election theology admits this. The matter of human will and divine election is so inscrutable, so incomprehensible to our minds, as to demand that we believe both without being able to comprehend how they fit together in God's mind. You know who said that? John MacArthur, the champion for God's sovereignty. Some things are just difficult. Chuck Smith said almost exactly the same thing from the other side of the issue in Calvary Distinctives. And so Calvaries don't generally push heavily on issues that divide, that are polarizing, that there is still debate upon. C.H. Spurgeon, though a staunch Calvinist, 
refuse to preach on the delineation of these seemingly contrary beliefs, leaving it to heaven to sort them out. In fact, he said in one of his sermons that I looked at this week, he said, when I get to heaven, I'm not even sure that even then my mind will be able to, con to, to correlate the truths of both of those things, of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility in choosing Christ. Hmm. John did say in John 6:37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So it certainly seems that God chose in eternity past who and who would not be saved. The ones who he chose, the elect, he gave to his son, and they will come to him, and Jesus won't cast them out. They're saved. Our question, my question, perhaps your question is, how or on what basis did God choose? Was it simply divine prerogative? Or did some other consideration prompt his choice? Well, we're not given the details. Evidently, God wants us just to trust him in matters that are too high for us to fully understand. But this is what I think. This is what I think. This is what Norland thinks. You may disagree. This is what I think. I admit that I don't know for certain but going through all the scriptures and the resources that I've gone through really for many years struggling with this, this is what I think. I believe God is sovereign. I don't believe he's capricious or arbitrary. I don't believe he has, or I believe he has a reason and purpose in electing those for salvation and not electing others. I believe he is good all the time. But all the time he is good, and he always does justly. In fact, Psalm 89, verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. I don't believe that God overrides man's free, overrides man's free will, causing him to believe or not believe against that will. I don't believe anyone is worthy of election. We are all sinners. But I do believe that there are two attributes of God which play upon his choices, the ones that he made in heaven regarding the elect. Again, I want to say this is my opinion. You ha may have another opinion. And if you'll have grace for me, I'll have grace for you. The first attribute is his attribute of omniscience. God knows everything at all times, past, present, and future. The truth of every matter is always before him. He knows it all. He guesses not. The second is his eternal nature, his infinite nature. He was and is and evermore shall be, Revelation 1, 8 says. God accommodates us in our earth boundedness by walking with us in time linearly, moment by moment. But he's not bound to time this way. In his eternality, all of time and all of the information about what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen, he experiences at the same time. He's not dependent on the clock to pass to know what's going to happen. That information is before him. The experience of every person who has ever lived is before God, before he created the first person. C.S. Lewis termed, uh, termed God's uh, um, time as God's eternal now. There's no yesterday, today, and forever. It's the eternal now. God never wonders what has happened, what is happening, or what will happen. He experiences it all every moment. I believe that God chooses or elects based upon his perfect knowledge of every human being. And he has that information before they were ever born. Who they are, what they've done, what they're going to do, and what they will do. 
He sees it all and he knows it all perfectly and presently. He doesn't guess or suppose. He, he knows. He chooses based upon that knowledge. And no one can question him on his choices because his perfect knowledge is never wrong. Long ago for us, before creation, he knew all of this, every experience of every man, woman, or being. He elected. He gave the elect to his son, and his son received them. He received all who believed. Our free will wasn't violated. We've always been responsible for our own choices. We still are. Yet God's sovereignty reigned throughout eternity by his foreknowledge. I love the way John Corson described our salvation experience. The opportunity came by. God's grace came to us, gave us the opportunity to make a decision for Christ. Would we accept Jesus or not? We listened. Our heart was moved. And we said, I believe and I receive Jesus as my Savior. We entered the kingdom of heaven and we were born again and adopted. As we approached the entrance, we saw a sign that said, Whosoever will may come. Quoting Revelation 22, 17. But as we went in through the entrance, we looked behind us on the interior of the entrance and it said, Welcome. I knew you were coming. I chose you and you are mine. Free will intact. Every man has free will. God's sovereignty active. God has never been surprised by any man's response to his son's invitation to come unto me. He's known it from before creation. I believe he elected those who he knew would accept his son. As Chuck Smith always asked, why would he elect those he knew wouldn't believe? To do that would be a strong arm persuasion violating the free will that he has given to mankind. God could have made us robots. Automaton. What's that word? Automaton. Automaton. Thank you. Automatons. He could have made us that. Sometimes I wish he would have. Because my free will gets in my face and causes me problems sometimes. Sometimes I wish he'd have just programmed me. Eh. Norland will always do right, say right, be right. But that's not the way he made us. He made us with free will. We are not robots. Do you think man has free will? Well, God seems to think so. Galatians 5.13, we read this. You were called to be free. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. John 2.17. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teachings come from God. Joshua, Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve. Mark 8, 34, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me by choice. I have that by choice, but that's what it's saying. Revelation 3, 20, 20 here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. And I'll eat with them. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. You are free to eat of any of the fruit in this garden, except for the, God, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree, or you will die. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. He will have mercy and freely pardon. John 1, 12 and 13. Yet to all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. Whether in the Old Testament or New Testament, the message of the gospel has always been given with a call for man to choose. He will bear the victory or the consequence of that choice. God always knew what his choice would be, but he didn't determine what that choice would be. Well, let's move on to verse 43 of chapter 13 of Acts. 
Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in grace. What does that mean? MacArthur writes, Some in the crowd who heard Paul's sermon apparently professed to believe. As they continued speaking to them, Paul and Barnabas were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Whether the faith of those listeners was genuine or not immediately apparent, they needed to validate their confession by continuing in the grace of God. Perseverance is a mark of saving faith. The Apostle John describes those whose faith was not genuine as those who went out from us. But they were not really of us, for they, if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us, 1 John 2, 19. Our Lord also stressed perseverance as the mark of true saving faith. Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It is the sign of true branches that they abide in the vine. Jesus goes on and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And that whole discussion in John 15, 1 through 6, is a delineation of the importance of remaining in the vine. If you're not, perhaps you weren't in the vine to begin with. Continuing in grace certainly seems to prove that salvation actually took place. Though well, some are pretty good at faking it, to not continue certainly leaves many questions for the observer. Of course, God is the only one who knows the heart. At worst, not continuing proves salvation has not occurred. But it's God who has to make that judgment, not us. Pastor Bob Hoekstra writes this, Yes, grace is not only the way we begin with the Lord, but it is also the means by which we go on with the Lord. God's grace is to be sought every day. It is a major error of the faith to relegate grace to days gone by. We can praise and thank the Lord for all of His, of all of His grace experienced in previous years. Nevertheless, the grace of God is essential today and each and every day. Also, it is so fitting that the saints in one town were exhorted to continue in the Lord, whereas other in another town they were called to continue in grace. Grace cannot be separated from the Lord Jesus, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 8 and 9. This morning as I'm sitting here in this front row, and I'm struggling with many things, I have been for some time, you know some of those, and I'm sitting there knowing the things that the Lord's put on my heart to share in the passage of Scripture we're looking is, at, is very important. And I'm just praying as we're worshiping and the songs of the lyrics of the songs are going through my heart and there's producing in my heart this desire. I hope that you felt that desire too, that desire to be closer to Him, to seek His grace in the difficult times of your life. I'm sitting there in the difficult times knowing my responsibility and saying, God, give me the grace to share things correctly from your word with the right heart in sharing those things. Grace is not a one-time thing. It's a way that we walk with God and we go with God. The book of Hebrews contains several warning passages aimed at those in that perilous position. They're summed up in chapter 10, but it says this in chapter 10, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul takes no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. For those of us who have loved ones who don't seem to be pursuing grace presently in, our li in their lives, these scriptures bring no comfort to us. If we're honest, and we look at those that our dearest to us, and we see them turning away from the way, walking away, not persevering, but walking away from the things of the Lord. Our heart aches when we hear these passages of Scripture saying how important perseverance and abiding in the vine is. 
We must remember that God judges the heart. We don't, but we can be concerned enough to inspect fruit and to pray. Some get caught up in judging, and that's a pretty dangerous usurpation of God's role, and I don't think he calls us to that, but I think he does call us to be concerned about people and observe and pray when we see something that seems amiss in their life. Verse uh, 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Oh my, national racial pride kept them from acting out and preserving grace. In fact, it caused them to reject the, the ambassadors and the message altogether. A true saint of grace wants God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. God loves so much that he sent his son that whosoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God's will. Always has been. It should be our desire, our, deal, our will that all comes and know Christ. But when these at first positive responders to Paul's sermon saw the Gentiles streaming in, to receive the gospel, they didn't want, they didn't want them in their assembly. They didn't want them to enjoy what God had offered to them. So in their jealousy, they turned against Paul and Barnabas, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting li life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. <laughs> Explosion. You're what? The Gentiles? Those filthy dogs? You'll go to the Gentiles? Verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. God didn't call the Jewish people as just to snuggle with them and hold them close, opposed to everybody else. He called them, he elected them to be his witnesses so that the whole world could be reached by the truth of who he was and who his Messiah would be. But they wouldn't have that. We are Abraham's seed. We're worthy. They are not. We want this club only for us. If it can't just be for us, we don't want any part of it. And so we reject the ambassadors that even bring us this message. Verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Here's another strong statement, seemingly to support God's strong, sovereign choice. They were appointed to eternal life, so they believed. And the debate continues, on and on and on, because there are scriptures on both sides. John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The choice being free, they believed. The work of the new birth was God's work. Verse 49. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. Racial pride works against grace. It does even to this day. Racial pride works against grace. We are called to grace. We've been given grace. We are to continue in grace. Racial pride cannot be a part of our lives. It works against grace. God loves all and wants all to come to repentance and to come to believe upon him. And we get in the way of that when racial pride 
wants to uh, eliminate certain segments of uh, our world because they're not the same as we are. Verse 51. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So we're going to pick up next week in chapter 14, still Paul's first missionary journey, but chapter 14 will end that. Let me ask you this morning, as you sit here and our time is gone, have you chosen to believe or are you expecting God to make that choice for you? Choose him today. He will prove his choice for you. Long ago, he chose you, and he'll prove that when you choose him. And he will take us to heaven to be with him forever. Let's pray, Lord in heaven. Thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word of being able to hear your voice speak, of listening to the promptings of your spirit, of helping us delineate what it is that you would say to the people of the world and to us. I pray, God, that you would help us to walk in grace, not just receive grace at salvation, but to walk in it and grow by grace. And help us, Lord, to be graceful for all those who are around us, that by our walking in grace and love, we would show your grace and they would see that they have a choice to make and they would choose you. Lord, be with us this week. We thank you for the grace you've given to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. If you are in need of prayer, we have Mike and Sue to partner with you in prayer. Let's stand and proclaim of God, proclaim God's goodness. The thing you give and take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say. Thank you so much. Praise God. Great to be